A day before Women's Day, we want to unpack the conversation about how important the Ingonyama Trust win uh, was and when it comes to land rights, particularly for women in this country. A group of mostly women led the Ingonyama Trust case to victory as we celebrate Women's Day under the theme, the year of Charlotte Manyama Klege, realizing women's rights. We want to highlight this victory and the challenges women are faced with in situations and in areas much like this. We're joined now by Nolundi Luaya, who's director at the Land and Accountability Research Center, as well as Nomboniso Gasao. She is the adjunct professor at UCT School of Public Law. Thank you to you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. Let, let me just first start with you, Nolundi. Whilst the ruling of the Ngonyama Trust leases is uh, said to be great, it has been criticised for taking a very long time, but it also has been held a victory that the monies of those who've been uh, paying for leasing of the land are to be returned to them. But has it done uh, anything? We know that it's been taken to the courts by women, but ultimately what will be the victories, the benefits for women? So, uh, Tipi, so, you know, I think the big thing that uh, the Ingonyama Trust judgment really puts on the table is this question about how do we strengthen the rights that people hold under customary law uh, without disadvantaging particular uh, elements of the population. So how do we find a way to recognize the strength of customary land rights, uh, to respect those rights, and to make sure that people have adequate security of tenure without uh, overshadowing or overriding the rights and entitlements that women themselves have. And so the case really surfaces the strength of customary land rights and makes it quite clear that the Ingonyama Trust uh, um, you know, was undermining those rights by converting them to lease agreements. But of course, the remaining question is, if leases are not an adequate mechanism for recognizing these customary land rights, what is an adequate mechanism? And what is the mechanism that most strengthens the position of women uh, within the families and within the communities in which they have customary land rights? So certainly the case uh, opens up a really important uh, stance around customary land rights, but there do remain a number of questions uh, and additional work that needs to happen. Okay, so we'll get to what questions you say in just a moment. But Ms. Gasso, you have said what we must be talking about is how government, in collusion with Parliament, you say, have failed citizens for two decades, particularly uh, political parties as a collective. Yes, I think first and foremost, we have to pay tribute to the women who are part of these um, rural communities for the struggles that they continue to wage, especially um, during the Women's Month. I think um, it's important that we realize that these changes don't just happen, but that women especially actually are in the forefront of these struggles and they often take enormous risks going up against institutions as powerful as Ingonyama Trust. Um, I think it's important to talk about the victory uh, of, of this judgment, but also to talk about the fact that we shouldn't even, been ha even be having these battles now, but because politicians in parliament, in government, they have failed to do what they are charged with. They failed to ensure that the constitutional provisions, provisions for equality, even under customary law, are made to be real. So people are having to wage the struggles. And I do think that we need to talk to politicians and say that insofar as um, the, the, the land rights of people who live in communal areas, that parliament, parliament and cabinet has neglected its responsibility. I suppose, and let me stick with you, Ms. Gaza, on this. The question has been, how did it, uh, Kadesa, find itself in a position where it was able to strike this deal um, with traditional leaders, with the Amazulu kingdom, particularly to, for it to have sole ownership of the land in the province at the expense of the people? How did we find ourselves here? I think we need to correct uh, the, this thing about ownership. Ingonyama Trust does 
is not supposed to own the land for and itself, it's supposed to hold that land in trust mm. for these communities that they were now introducing leases and charging them um, rent in their ancestral land. So they don't own the land. The land is owned by South Africans. Ngonyama Trust was created to, 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 to establish a land holding system uh, on behalf of people in Gozuru Natal. It's also important to look back to history and, and acknowledge that in Gwenyama Trust, because it was a large last ditch uh, arrangement between um, the apartheid government on its way out and um, and, and and I suppose in Gata led um, interests. So it has a lot of weaknesses, it has a lot of loopholes. But it is a product of this country's history. In Trust was one of those arrangements that were made in order to ensure that IFP, if you remember, IFP was very late on the ballot to ensure that IFP came to the ballot. Okay, so Ms. Lua, you were saying earlier on the fact that there are still a lot of questions to ask, including we know that uh, Isilo. Goodwill is uh, it, That created some tension. This court case itself, it is believed that uh, uh, the new Isilo King, Mrs. Zulu, may be willing to re renegotiate the matter somewhat. But where would he begin? So, are these some of the questions that you were talking about that we should still be raising? So I think the, the thing to make very clear is that this was never a case uh, against Isilo, uh, and it was never a case, you know, against uh, the kingship uh, of Amazulu. Uh, and so certainly the fact that obviously we are still awaiting the confirmation of Mrs. Zulu uh, as the trustee um, is part of the equation. But the biggest thing, Tepiso, is that actually the Ingonyama Trust has indicated an intention to appeal the judgment, uh, which is something to take note of because the Minister uh, of Rural Development um, and Land Reform had made it clear that uh, they were going to study the judgment um, and that they were going to do what they could to abide by the judgment. Uh, and we must note that the judgment takes a very strong uh, reprimand to the minister uh, and indicates the minister actually failed in her duty to protect, promote and respect the land rights that people have uh, under Ipura. So there is this question that the Ungonyama Trust has indicated an intention to appeal. And there is, of course, uh, a question about the appeal grounds. Um, it seems that the trust is taking issue with some of the uh, manner in which the court reached the decisions that they did. So that would be one place to start, is this question of the appeal, uh, whether it you know, has uh, legitimacy, whether it has um, the full sanction and, and backing, uh, not only of the trust, but also of the ministry. And then there is the question, of course, about uh, the refunds that the court has ordered, this, this question about the repayment of money uh, by people who had paid um, rental amounts under the agreements. And there, too, there is a massive question, uh, and one I think that sits with the Portfolio Committee in Parliament as part of their oversight, to find a way um, to make sure that this money is repaid. Because, of course, there is a question about where the money would come from, if it was used as revenue by the Ngonyama Trust, whether they still have that money in their coffers, uh, and how it is that one can actually action this repayment element. So those are sort of two of the starting points, I would say, um, for the incoming trustee of the Ngonyama Trust mm. uh, at this point. And to come back to you, Ms. Gaza, I want to talk about the traditional courts bill. That um, it's been how many years since its introduction? Do you say 13? The role of that and how you say it has, the, even though researchers and activists and politicians have been trying to work together uh, with the Department of Justice, that chiefs have sneaked in the back door agreements that ignored warnings of the importance of the opt clause. Talk to us a little bit more about this. Um, the South African Constitution recognizes the place and role of traditional, of the institution of traditional leadership in this country. It also affirms the place and status of customary, African customary law. The constitution says that all these um, have to be held against the, 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 the fundamental principles in the constitution, that is the Bill of Rights. So every piece of legislation that is being passed has got to be tested 
against the constitution, whether it meets the constitutional um, requirements and whether it is um, reasonable in terms of equality. So the issue with the traditional courts bill is that one of the important principles uh, of, of introducing a, a law like this, it has to provide people who live in rural communities, in the communities that are going to be affected by the traditional courts bill, it has to provide them the right to opt in or to opt out because customary law, which um, is the basis on which uh, the, the, this, um, this, this legislation is based, um, it provides people the right to belong and to use customary law. It also provides flexibility in terms of opting out. So the argument um, by, by many, including some traditional leaders, has been that uh, you know you, when you talk about uh, the common law courts, when you talk about the magistrate court, the magistrate doesn't call people. This is an example that they make. They don't call people who have broken the law and say um, you can come and answer if you want to. But uh, so because of that, they argue that this should be the case with the traditional courts, but that if you live in those communities, it automatically applies. But we are talking about two legal systems here. The customary law is about affiliation. It's about belonging. It's about choosing to be part of a community. And it's important that the bill carries, I mean, the law carries this principle and protects it. And insofar as um, the, the traditional courts bill um, does not provide an explicit right for people to opt out, it fails to meet its constitutional test. Mm. Let me then ask you uh, this question, Ms. Luaya. How, what has been the practical day-to-day -day experiences then of women, particularly in rural areas? When we talk about uh, traditional leadership, when we talk about customary law, when we talk about the legislature and policies that govern rural uh, land and how it's structured, are women automatically just you know, prevented from agency? I think that the experience of rural women uh, on the ground is probably one of severe struggle. Um, as Professor Gassa indicates, they take upon themselves incredible risk in going up against systems to push for and to claim space, to push for and to claim their rights. Uh, certainly the, uh, the women that we've worked with uh, in you know, the years that we've been doing this work, it's a range of experiences, but predominantly it's about the use of power to suppress women's spaces for claiming their rights, whether those are rights to land, uh, whether that's about access to justice. It really is uh, about a uh, use of power that seems to denigrate uh, and degrade the rights that women hold. So in the land uh, sort of debate and in the land arena, part of women's experiences is, you know, being evicted from their homes uh, after their husbands pass away, so being uh, evicted by their in-laws. In other instances, being told that, you know, without a, a male uh, child, they have no entitlement to the land that they live on. Um, the experience experiences of sisters, you know, being barred from accessing the family home uh, or even returning from home um, if they, you know, are returning from a troubled marriage, um, being barred by brothers, being barred by other siblings. So really it's about this uh, kind of treatment of women's land rights as being secondary. And that really means that those land rights are at the mercy, essentially, uh, of the primary land rights holder, who with a lot of mechanisms, things like title deeds, things like registering land rights, predominantly those types of mechanisms for securing rights will favor the primary land rights holder. And in the instance where that isn't a woman, her land rights then become secondary to those of the primary land rights holder. And that is the type of arrangement that really shifts the power in ways that can be incredibly detrimental um, to women and that can really impact uh, their experiences okay. on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I do apologize to you both, but this is where we're going to have to end it. But thank you for your time and your insights. Uh, we've just been speaking there to uh, Nolundi Luaya, who is the director at the and Accountability Research Center, as well as Nomboni Sokasa. She is the adjunct professor at UCT's School of Public Law.